Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Sipstelny, your lecture instructor this term, and we are continuing in Game Design Workshop this week, and we will be discussing the uh, system dynamics of games today. Um, previously, we talked about uh, the goals of games being for the entertainment of players and that games will create a structured conflict and uh, they give players an entertaining process to resolve that conflict. We're going to talk today about games as systems. All right, systems have objects. Here is a uh, game called Batgammon and there are objects. There are player movable tokens in this game. There are also dice in this game and these objects have properties. They have a color, they have a position on the board. Um, the uh, dice will have a number that they are showing. In video games, objects have properties too. Uh, a sprite can be animated. It may have a transparent background. It might be solid. Uh, and you set all kinds of properties in your objects when you uh, create them in your games. Um, objects also have what we call behaviors. Behaviors are not the same thing as properties. All right, moving from one position to another position, the position is a property, but the moving is a behavior of that object. Um, the dice have the behavior of generating random numbers. At any given moment, they may have a number shown. That would be a property, but the behavior is you roll them to make new random numbers. Let's talk about some other object behaviors. Um, you could press a key to move the mama dragon up and down in your version of evil clutches. Um, you could press the space bar to launch a fireball from that object. A collision with a baby and that object would rescue the baby. And a collision with a demon and your mama dragon object ends the game. Those are all behaviors of objects. So we will be speaking in terms of uh, behaviors and properties. Let's talk a little bit about randomness and system dynamics here. Um, many games have shooting in them. Not all games have any kind of shooting, but shooting may be modeled as a random event. Although in the real world, real shooting of a real gun or laser or whatever follows the laws of physics. It would be deterministic, we would say. Whether the shot hits the target or not depends on where it is aimed, not on randomness. But games often use something called probability, probabilistic modeling, using dice or cards or in the case of computer games, random number generators to determine the outcome of a shot. Um, here's an example of a mobile game uh, that I have on my phone. Uh, Armored Defense 2 has both. And um, I think uh, most tower defense games like Plants vs. Zombies also have both. Uh, Plants vs. Zombies certainly has deterministic shooting modeled. So let's look at the modeling here. If your laser towers are in range of an enemy tank in this game, it hits, the same as with most tower defense games. However, uh, enemies have anti-missiles, and those anti-missiles in this particular game have a 50% chance of intercepting your incoming missile. That's probabilistic. It's a coin flip, 50% chance of hitting or missing. Um, in Armored Defense 2, there's a play field, lots of... Uh, Power defense games have a play field that shows position of objects, orientation, which ways the object is facing, and the terrain, where you can place new objects, and what paths uh, enemies can follow, for example. All of these positions, orientations, terrain, these are all system dynamics. Um, here's uh, another game. This is a uh, choice of games games, choice of the star captain. Uh, it's another mobile game, and this game is, uh, has no shooting, uh, not that you aim a weapon or anything, but the outcomes of player decisions are deterministic. 
based on your player stats. In this case, I'm playing a character that has a high bravado and a high improvisation and engineering, very low fitness and not very good on diplomacy, you can see in those stats. It could have been probabilistic. It could have been that it would make a die roll if I tried something bravado-ish, and I would have a 63% chance of success in this case, and a 40% chance of fitness success in this case. But the way these games are working, uh, you build your character up to a certain threshold, you will make a decision, and you will decide, all right, I am going to attempt to use my bravado. And if you have built your bravado up to a high enough level, you will automatically succeed. If you are not above that threshold, you will automatically fail. That is deterministic. Let's talk a little bit about probability, because in your careers as game designers, you will probably run across probability and random numbers generated by, let's say, a pair of dice. Lots of games use that. And the outcome of a pair of dice, when added together, gives you a random number between 2 and 12. Um, you cannot roll lower than a 2. You cannot roll higher than a 12. Those numbers include all possible outcomes. It turns out that it is not equally likely to get all of those outcomes. Let's look at what we could get. If I roll two dice and the first one comes up a 1 and the second one comes up a 1, I get a 2. If I roll them and the first one comes up a 1 and the second one comes up a 2, I get a 3. If I get a 1, 3, I, my result is 4. A 1, 4, my result is a 5. A 1, 5, my result is a 6. And a 1, 6, my result is a 7. And that is the highest I can get if the first die came out as a 1 when I rolled them. If the first die comes out as a 2, I automatically cannot get 2 anymore. Can't get a snake eyes. My first one is a 2 and the second is a 1, then I've got a 3. Uh, 2, 2 is a 4, 2, 3 is a 5, 2, 4 is a 6, 2, 5 is a 7, and if I get a 2, 6, that's the first chance I've got of rolling an 8. And you can see if I roll a 3, 1, I get a 4, etc., etc., etc. It builds up like that. The... Uh, Outcome of getting a 7 is the highest probability because there are a lot of different combinations that yield a 7. There's only one combination that yields a 2 and only one combination that yields a 12. So those are much less likely to come out, the 2 and the 12 versus the 7. We call this the binomial probability distribution. This is a binomial distribution. Um, it's nice and discrete. That means I can't get any decimals in there. I can't roll a 2.401 or something like that. I can roll a 2 or a 3, but nothing in between. And you can see the probabilities of those outcomes. I have a one, There are 36 possible outcomes of rolling two dice. One of them yields snake eyes, a 2. One of them yields a uh, 12, but six of them yield a 7. So I've got a one-sixth chance of rolling a, um, a 7. And 6 and 8 are my next most likely outcomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As you design games, you can take these probabilities into account. And you could calculate them for other dice other than six-sided dice, too, if you wanted to. Now, there are many other probability distributions, and you will probably run across them in your careers as game developers, if you're working in computer games anyway. This would be the normal distribution, which we might use for uh, aiming a weapon. Um, it's shaped like that. Here's an exponential distribution. We would use that in a queuing type problem. Um, I'm not asking you to memorize these, but you should be aware of the existence of lots of different probability distributions, and we know how to do calculations and manipulate and use these things in our game development, and uh, I hope you get to explore more of that later on in your career. Moving on with objects. Objects have properties, uh, properties or qualities or attributes of uh, physical or conceptual aspects. All right, what does that mean? The position of this koala in this maze 
is a property. It happens to be a dynamic property. It can change. The position can move as that koala runs around in the maze. This TNT in the maze has a position also, but that doesn't move. It is static. So it has a static property. What are the behaviors are the potential changes in properties? Key presses are a behavior of that object that causes the koala to move. A collision between a koala and a TNT causes the TNT to explode. That is a behavior of TNT. Let's talk about relationships. If there are no relationships, then you don't have a system. You just have a collection of objects. But we do have relationships here. There's a distance between the koala and the TNT, a relative position between the two. Oops. And uh, the relationship that if the koala touches the TNT, the TNT explodes and then the koala dies. That's a relationship between them. Um, other dynamic systems have uh, economies. We're looking here at the economy of Farmville in this little video I shot here of playing Farmville where you can buy stuff. It's a kind of a, a very simplified economy, but you make money and you buy seeds that you can plant and animals that you can place in your farm, etc. An economy can be a simple barter system in a game. It can be a simple market system in a game. And uh, it could be a complex market where prices fluctuate based on supply and demand. Um, and there can be a meta-economy. Games give us the concept of a meta-economy that almost didn't exist before games existed. What am I talking about? An economy that stands above the game itself? Well, in Magic the Gathering, which, if you've never played it, is a two-player dueling system where players buy and sell the cards using real currency in the real world, and then they take these cards, enter the magic circle with another player, and they play the game. So they have an economy on one scale outside the game, and then they enter the game, and they have an economy going on inside the game. Another meta economy, similar game, um, Star Trek Attack Wing came out a few years ago, and it's a similar card system, and it adds collectible toys, spaceships. And there are a lot of other games coming out that have uh, collectible toys as part of their meta economies. Um, there's also uh, this game um, is uh, uh, Second Life, and that is pretty much nothing but meta economy. There's not a lot of game going on, but in uh, Second Life, there is real currency exchange to get property in the game. Um, here's a meta economy in, um, well, this doesn't exist anymore. They stopped making these, um, these games. But I could spend currency to buy power-ups for these puzzle games um, and to buy puzzles themselves uh, in that game. Emergent systems. Emergent systems happen when simple rules yield complex results. You're gonna, you've probably run across emergence in games before. Well, a great example is the stock market. The rules of the stock market are very simple, but the behavior of the stock market is extremely complex and difficult to predict. Um, formerly, emergence was a topic for philosophers, but now gamers are getting involved because there's a lot of emergence that takes place in games. Can you think of an example of emergence in gaming that you've come across? Anyone in the room? Well, let's explore emergence a little bit. So if it's when simple rules yield complex, complex results, you get intentional emergence built into the game, like The Sims. The rules of The Sims are very simple. Just about all of the entertainment you get out of playing The Sims is from its emergence of what happens as you build your little world for your sims. You also get unintentional emergence where players discover new ways to play the game. Um, in this case, Farmville um, didn't encourage you to box in your little character with hay bales, but it actually made it easier and quicker to play 
you could spend less time grinding by playing that style. All right, more about simple rules yielding complex results. John Conway's Game of Life. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Well, for our purposes, he called it a game. It does not fit our definition of a game because there are no players. But it is definitely a system with system dynamics. So you have cells here that contain either life or non-life. The dark cells contain life. It's binary. And the white cells contain no life. And it's either living or dead. And the simple rules are a cell with two or three neighbors will survive for the next iteration. It's an iterative game that goes through cycle after cycle. A cell with zero or one neighbors dies of loneliness. And a cell with four or more neighbors is overpopulated and gets strangled to death. An empty space with exactly three neighbors yields birth. And that's it. Those are all the rules for the game of life. And so starting off with number one here, we have a cell. We have five cells with life represented. And in the next iteration, you will see this cell, this cell, this cell, and this cell have exactly three neighbors, so there will be birth. This cell in the center has four neighbors, so there will be death. And so this is the following iteration. And you can see what happens in the next iteration, where the cells with uh, four or more neighbors have death, and the cells with exactly three neighbors have birth, and the cells with uh, two or three neighbors survive to the next iteration. And it goes and progresses through. And you can see this very, very complex behavior until it reaches this stable state here in 7, 8, 9, and 10, where it starts blinking that way. So it grows from here. I should have an animation of this for this lecture. So that's a classic example of emergence. Let's talk for a moment about unintentional of emergence, a new way to play the game that the creators didn't intend Halo 2 is the classic example of that, where players discovered this thing called BXRing using the controls in the game. And that was a button combination that allowed simultaneous shooting and rapid melee combat at the same time. They didn't intend that to work when they designed the game. Players discovered it and liked playing that way. And that's it for this week. Next time, we are going to talk about um, social and mobile games. Until next time, this is Mike Substelny signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.